PC recording is underway. Cloud recording all set. Backup is rolling. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Hospitals jointly with Fire and Emergency Management. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, please place cell phones to vibrate or silent. If you have testimony you wish to submit for the record, you may do so via email by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, I'm Chair of the Committee on Hospitals. I'd like to start by thanking the co chair of this hearing, Council Member Borelli, as well as my colleagues, for being present today for this very important hearing. We are here today to discuss New York City hospitals' preparedness for weather emergencies. The New York City metropolitan area was struck by disaster in early September as the remnants of Hurricane Ida flooded roads, homes, and subways. At least 45 people lost their lives in New York and New Jersey. We lost 13 New York City residents due to this terrible storm. Storm Ida was the worst natural disaster to strike our city since 2012's Superstorm Sandy. Health and Human Services Secretary Xavier Becerra declared public health emergencies for New York and New Jersey due to the damage inflicted by the storm. New York Governor Hochul and Mayor de Blasio both declared states of emergencies. Governor Hochul cited the record shattering rainfall and stated that there are no more cataclysmic unforeseeable events and that we need to foresee these in advance and be prepared. She is right. This was not the first superstorm to hit New York City, and unfortunately, it will probably not be the last. According to an October 2021 report from the First Street Foundation, a growing part of the U.S. will face an increased risk of critical infrastructure, like emergency services and hospitals being rendered inoperable due to severe flooding linked to climate change over the next 30 years. As hospital systems are increasingly being disrupted due to climate-fueled weather disasters like more intense hurricanes, flooding, and heat waves, they must harden their infrastructure and prepare for the worst. We saw what a superstorm could do to our city when we weren't prepared. Superstorm Sandy wreaked havoc on New York City in 2012, causing flooding and power outages throughout the city's five boroughs. Five city hospitals were forced to evacuate because of the storm. New York Downtown Hospital, Manhattan VA Medical Center, Coney Island Hospital, Bellevue Hospital, and NYU Langone Medical Center. New York Downtown Hospital, Manhattan VA Medical Center, and Coney Island Hospital all lost power. But the hospitals have learned from this experience and have been undergoing resiliency projects, repairs, and infrastructure improvements. Hospitals installed flood walls, repositioned and hardened internal systems, such as generators and plumbing, raised emergency departments and critical systems above flood level, and acquired new communications systems. These improvements helped hospitals stay open during Storm Ida. However, there was still some minor flooding in some hospitals, including Richmond University Medical Center, Elmhurst Hospital, and Lincoln Hospital. The work continues. According to the city's independent budget office, 20% of the city's hospital beds are in or near flood zones. With climate change increasing the incidence of weather events like Ida, hospitals must continue to undergo resiliency projects to fortify themselves against future and natural disasters and must continue to prepare for such events. As a city, we must also ensure that we are supporting hospitals in these efforts. We look forward to hearing from H&H &H and of course, New York City Office of Emergency Management today about how they are working to ensure that we remain prepared for future extreme weather events. I wanna thank the administration and to everyone who is present to testify today. I would also like to thank the hospital committee staff, Council Harbani Ahuja, Policy Analyst and Balkan, 
finance analyst Lauren Hunt, and data analyst Rachel Alexandrov, as well as my team, for their work on this hearing. And I will actually turn it over now to my co-chair, Chair Borelli, for his opening remarks. Good morning and thank you. Uh, I'm Council Member Joe Borelli, and of course we're joined by uh, Council Members Brannon Cabrera Maisel uh, from my committee. I believe Councilman Gennaro will be joining us soon. Uh, thank you to Chair Rivera for holding this committee jointly. Uh, the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management oversees the Office of Emergency Management, uh, which is responsible for coordinating New York City's emergency planning and response for all types and scales of emergencies, including extreme weather emergencies, such as coastal storms and flash flooding. We're gathered today to discuss the important topic of emergency planning for NYC hospitals to assure the continuity of medical care during extreme weather situations. As we saw during a number of storms this summer, most notably with Storm Ida in September, uh, and even during yesterday's Nor'easter, the city faces ongoing issues of extreme flash flooding during periods of heavy rain. These events, which have proven deadly at times, present challenges to the city's aging infrastructure and the ability of our city to deliver vital emergency services to residents in need. Today, the committee will examine several areas related to the readiness of hospitals and first responders to provide medical care in times of extreme flooding. We look forward to hearing the testimony from the administration, uh, both New York City Emergency Management and h, &H about how these vital efforts uh, and examine the detailed planning that are taken to ensure that all New Yorkers remain safe when facing flood emergencies. I will turn it back over to the committee council to uh, swear in the administration. Thank you, chairs. My name is Hrabani Ahuja and I'm counsel to the Committee on Hospitals for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should sub submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panelist to give testimony will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use a raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after that panelist has completed their testimony. Um, before we swear in the administration, I just want to acknowledge the council members that are present. We have council member Ayala, council member Brannon, council member Cabrera, council member Eugene, council member Maisel, council member Moya, council member Reynoso, and council member Gennaro. Um, we'll now be swearing in members from the administration. Um, I'll be calling on you each individually for a response. Testimony will be provided by Laura Ivacoli, Senior Assistant Vice President for Emergency Management at h, h Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions. Megan Prebram, Deputy Commissioner of Planning and Resilience at NISIM. Robert Bristol, Director of Health and Medical at NISIM, Christina Farrell, Acting First Deputy Commissioner at NISIM, and Christine Flaherty, Senior Vice President of Office of the Office of Facilities Development at h, h Before we begin, I'll be administering the oath. I will call on you each individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Laura Ivacoli? Yes, I do. Thank you. Megan Prebram? Yes, I do. Thank you. Robert Bristol? Yes, I do. Thank you. Christina Farrell? I believe she might not be on. If she um, comes on later, we'll swear her in. Christine Flaherty? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Laura Ivacoli, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. 
Thank you so much. And thank you for having me here today. Good morning, Chairperson Rivera, Chairperson Borelli, and members of the Committee on Hospitals and the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I am Laura Ivacoli, Deputy Chief Medical Officer at New York City Health and Hospitals Elmhurst and Senior Assistant Vice President for Emergency Management at New York City Health and Hospitals. I'm joined this morning by Christine Flaherty, Senior Vice President of Office of Facilities Development. I don't think Menji made it on. Menji Indar may be coming on, Senior Director of Office of Facilities and Development at Health and Hospitals, as well as Robert Bristol, Director of Health and Medical, Megan Prebum, Deputy Commissioner of Planning and Resilience at the New York City Emergency Management. I'm happy to testify before you to discuss the New York City Hospital's preparedness for weather emergencies. Hospitals play an essential role in planning for and responding to the needs of New Yorkers during any citywide emergency, particularly weather emergencies. In recent years, healthcare emergency management regulatory requirements have significantly increased since major disasters such as the 9-11 terrorist attacks, Hurricane Katrina and Superstorm Sandy. To ensure the safety of its patients and staff, health and hospitals have extensive plans in place in the event of weather, public health, or other catastrophic emergencies. Health and hospitals emergency operations uh, response plans are developed to address all hazards with specific incident response annexes and guides for high probability and high impact events, which include extreme weather events such as coastal storms, extreme temperatures, and winter and summer weather events. Each of our sites is required to conduct training and exercises to test and evaluate their plans. Planned exercises and actual response activations are reviewed to identify gaps and areas for improvement. Emergency operations response plans are then revised to incorporate changes and improvements identified, as well as physical improvements, including the hardening of our facilities, purchase of needed equipment and supplies or training for staff. Health and Hospitals uses an incident command system to, to manage all disasters, emergencies and other incidents. The ICS, which is the incident command system, is a national best practice for coordinating emergency response and allows for communication, coordination and collaboration with other agencies. At central office, a central office incident management team embedded within the system's ICS is responsible for coordinating emergency response across the system. The five main components of incident command are operations, planning, logistics, finance, and administration. And once health and hospitals activates the ICS, internal and external notifications are made while information is gathered for situational awareness. Staff are assigned to their incident command roles. Briefings are held providing the latest intelligence. Uh, an incident action plan is developed for the first operational period. This process then repeats itself uh, for the ongoing operational periods throughout the activation. To facilitate coordination with our sites, regular WebEx, WebEx meetings are convened with the cadence determined by the type and scope of the event. Information is gathered vetted and shared. Modes of communication used to share the information with staff include Everbridge Emergency Alert System that sends messages via phone, email, and text, Health and Hospitals Intranet, Outlook emails, Emergency Alerts Intranet blog, and Alertus, which is the system's immediate emergency alert notification across facilities via pop-ups and ticker tape desktop messages. Once activated, the cadence of meetings within central office incident management team and site leadership is established. A typical cadence of meetings would be daily morning calls with all senior central office leadership, chain of communication from our facilities to central office with their needs, daily site leadership logistics and planning touch bases and broader system-wide leadership briefings weekly. Additionally, all staff webinars and emails are implemented to disseminate important information to all staff. Similarly, for preparation and planning for an emergency, Health and Hospitals also utilizes the ICS. Trainings and exercises take place regularly where each facility tests components of the emergency operations plan to ensure operations and communications run smoothly. 
Health in Hospitals has been activated in response to the COVID-19 pandemic since January of 2020. During this time, we have had to concurrently respond to multiple other emergencies, including coastal storms, four winter storms, mass transit shutdown, extreme heat, civil unrest, and staffing issues early in the COVID response. Health and Hospitals has maintained operations throughout each emergency event and provided continuity of care to our patients and communities we serve. With the evolution and implementation of ET3, which is Emergency Triage, Treat and Transport, Health and Hospitals has been able to care for patients who call for 911 safely from their homes during times of emergencies via telemedicine. Although the ET3 program uh, began during the height of the pandemic, it is also, also useful in times of weather emergencies. This program allows for the city to prioritize emergency services to those who more emergently need emergency services while redirecting lower acuity 911 calls to the appropriate level of care through additional options such as telemedicine. However, we do not work alone. Health and Hospitals works closely with, this, with City Hall and New York City Emergency Management in all phases of emergency management, including planning, mitigation, response, recovery, training, and exercises. We are part of the ESF-8 Health and Medical Branch of New York City Emergency Management. If NISM activates their Emergency Operations Center, Health and Hospitals has a representative serve as a liaison to facilitate coordination, gather and disseminate information, and request and provide resources. Additionally, Health and Hospitals sits on several committees and work groups convened by NISUM. These include ESF-8 work group, citywide logistics committee, shelter planning committee, continuity of operations work group, urban area work group, coastal storm steering committee, winter weather steering committee, and heat emergency steering committee. Each year, Health and Hospitals participates in exercises with other agencies led by NISM. The intent of these exercises is to test and plan identified gaps. However, real life activations also serve this purpose and allow for real time identification of gaps and resolution of issues. Scenarios for past NISM exercises have included snowstorms, transit disruptions, nuclear attacks, and coastal storms. In addition, Health and Hospitals partners with other hospital systems in New York City through the Greater New York Hospital Association to prepare for emergency events. Health and Hospitals is a voting member of New York City Healthcare Coalition Governance Board led by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Health and Hospitals is a network coalition, healthcare coalition and each of our acute care sites participates in borough healthcare coalitions with hospitals, nursing homes and other community partners. In the aftermath of Super Storm Standy, Health and Hospitals understood the importance of recovery services. Our sites that incurred flood damage made major improvement measures, including moving critical infrastructure to higher floors, flood protection for our facilities, flood resistant infrastructure, investing in generators, electrical panels, HVAC systems, and other capital projects. Additionally, we entered into a system-wide recovery service contract with Northstar. Northstar will assist our system in getting back to normal operations in the aftermath of a disaster, including assisting with pumping flood water, repair of utilities, implementation of flood mitigation equipment, additions of generators, and movement of essential equipment to higher floors to mitigate flood damage. Most recently, during Hurricane Ida, Health and Hospitals collaborated with NISUM, DOHMH, and Greater New York Health Association on a situational awareness for a post-storm impact survey. This cross-regional event allows us, allowed us to query sites in real time about impacts to supplies, infrastructure, staffing, system and utility emergency department volumes, emergency operations center status, medically vulnerable community members, non-patient sheltering, and other comments. It helped to inform local agencies of system status, such as EMS and FIDNI, and allowed for system situational awareness within New York City systems and to New York City and New York State Department of Health. Health and Hospitals is committed to keeping its, staff, its patients, staff, and infrastructure safe from natural disasters. 
thank you for your attention to this important topic. We are happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'm going to now turn it to questions from Chair Rivera, followed by Chair Borelli. Panelists, if you can stay unmuted um, during this question and answer period, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, Chair Rivera. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Levine. Well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your testimony. I just want to add, I, you know, it's a timely hearing, of course. I know um, yesterday and the day before we had pretty severe weather. Um, I know it wasn't as harmful as some of the events that you described, but um, certainly want to kind of get into, I guess, how the city could also be helpful. And you've mentioned moving infrastructure, your system-wide recovery network, your COVID response, the, the continuity of care. What sort of support could h, &H receive from the city during a weather emergency? For example, what sort of organizational and resource support, uh, like equipment, could the city provide? Thank you very much for that question. And that is a great question. Um, so again, uh, Health and Hospitals works very closely with New York City Emergency Management um, and is uh, a part of the New York City Emergency Management ESF-8 Health and Medical. Um, and we have liaisons with New York City Emergency Management when uh, New York City Emergency Management activates. And any time that New York uh, Health and Hospitals needs any assistance, we do go through New York City uh, Emergency Management and they will procure any items that Health and Hospitals needs uh, and uh, loop in any agencies that would help to respond to any needs that we would have. So specifically, or is there anything that the city that you're looking forward to them providing or, or supporting you with? I guess, you know, how often, on average, how often does h, &H require support from the city during weather related emergencies? That is also a really good question. So uh, we have been uh, very fortunate in New York City Health and Hospitals has been being able to manage uh, very skillfully internally. Uh, for the majority of our um, city emergencies. Um, we first, of course, manage within our system. We will then leverage, um, you know, sister systems um, if we need help and then reach out to New York City Emergency Management. Um, and then it would, obviously they would involve the state and if the state needed to, they would involve uh, federal as well. Um, it has been very, very infrequent that we have had to reach out to New York City Emergency Management, but they are always receptive and extremely helpful whenever we need any resources from them. So does H&H &H have a, a system-wide plan for weather-related emergencies? For example, how do, how do hospitals within the system coordinate in the event of an, a weather emergency? Yes, that, and that is also a really good question. Um, so uh, New York City Health and Hospitals has a system-wide emergency operations plan. In addition, each of our acute care facilities and post-acute facilities have their own individual emergency operations plans that work off of the same uh, overall template, but they are tailored to each facility because each facility has its own risks. Um, and it has its own ability to um, mitigate those risks and respond to any events. Um, but we work as a system, we could coordinate between all of our uh, 11 acutes, our five post acutes, our Gotham sites, um, and we will uh, shuffle resources around as needed staff, equipment, um, patients if need be, um, space, um, will be leveraged throughout the system. So we work as an, as an overall entity um, very well and coordinated. You mentioned sister hospitals. What, what does that mean? So, sorry, I'm not exactly sure what I exactly said, but uh, I usually, when I say sister hospitals, I mean our, our system, I usually refer to our, you know, there's the overall umbrella system and then each of our facilities, we consider ourselves sister hospitals, if that was what I was referring to. So you mean like the Gotham sites? So like um, Elmhurst and Queens are our sister hospitals and Jacoby and, um, you know, all of our acutes, we, we call ourselves sister hospitals. But yes, uh, also the post-acutes and the Gothams as well. So just a larger network then? 
Yes. So the, yes, it's like a family made up of a lot of sisters. It's yeah. Sorry. A bit of a slang term. I okay. Apologize. No, it's all right. I just wasn't sure how the coordination was with hospitals under, I guess, kind of the greater New York hospital umbrella. And, and I'll ask them when they testify. Um, because we did see that the coordination was something that you really had to work on, especially in terms of the COVID-19 response. And I think you all did an incredible job considering the circumstances. So you have to work within your system, of course. I mean, I guess, uh, as well as the other, the NYUs of the world and the New York Presbyterians. So I guess, what are some of the lessons you've learned since then that you've implemented? Oh, that's a, a great question as well. So. Um, we absolutely learned first that coordination within the system is paramount, but also having an open dialogue with other systems is equally imperative. And Greater New York Hospital Association has been the key in bringing all of the systems together in our uh, region. Uh, they bring us together in the Emergency Preparedness Coordinating Council. Um, they bring us together when needed during activations on daily calls so that we can speak to each other, we can share information, um, and we can request help from each other. And, and it's been really a, a, an important response key that's, that they implemented. So would you say something that you've really worked to improve is internal communications? Yes, absolutely. I think internal communications as well. I'm sorry, did somebody want to say something? No, I just wanted a few more details. I, I appreciate yes. like the, the broad strokes here, but I was trying to get yeah. a little bit more nuanced. Yes, so internal coordination, internal communication, as well as communication and coordination with uh, the regional systems as well, leveraging Greater New York Health Association, uh, as well as New York City Healthcare Coalition, which we are a member of, and NISUM, of course, as well. We, we leverage all of those um, umbrellas to help us coordinate between other systems and other agencies. So h, &H has undergone resiliency efforts since Superstorm Sandy in 2012 in order to avoid issues in the future. Can you provide an overview of this work and of the project? And can you speak more about the Bellevue Coastal Resiliency Project? And can we just get an overall update? That is a, a, a very good question. Yes, h, h has undergone resiliency efforts since Superstorm Sandy in 2012 in order to avoid issues in the future. And I will pass that, the specifics of the answers off to my senior vice president of the Office of Facilities and Development, uh, Christine Flaherty. Thank you so much. This is a great uh, topic. One I'm very passionate about is investing in the resources of our infrastructure at Health and Hospitals. So thanks so much for the question. Um, we have been overhauling our infrastructure uh, with our FEMA grant across our, you know, especially our four most vulnerable sites, uh, Kohler, Metropolitan, Bellevue, and Coney Island. Uh, our, our biggest, uh, most proud accomplishment is, is looking at our future Ruth Bader Ginsburg Hospital, uh, where it's just well underway, and we're, we're really excited about that hospital in that we'll have a 500-year inpatient tower a fully elevated uh, ED, and uh, we're incredibly excited about that, as well as the entire campus being fortified. Um, Metropolitan equally uh, underway with many resiliency measures. Many projects have been completed related to smaller scale mitigation work of elevating and raising uh, many of our systems, and we have current projects underway, including uh, elevating uh, elevator equipment and things of that nature to ensure that should a water inundation event occur, we are able to uh, you know, fight on ground and, and kind of stay in our hospitals as much as possible. Uh, when it comes to the Bellevue community flood wall, uh, we have you know, studied this project in multiple iterations and we're excited for Department of Design and Construction to uh, bring this project for us into fruition. Uh, the project is uh, you know, starting down to the south and up to the north, uh, and it will be critical for us to, to expedite that project and, and start design on that uh, forthcoming with Department of Design and Construction. I'm looking forward to it as well. I know there's been, this has been a long conversation, and we've come a long way, so I hope we can be helpful with that. 
So how does health and hospitals work with FDNY and EMS to address any issues with emergency medical transportation to and from H and H facilities during weather related emergencies? So again, uh, New York City, uh, thank you, that's a good question. New York City uh, Health and Hospitals works very closely with uh, EMS through uh, Greater New York Health Association, as well as New York City Emergency Management. Um, we join in the same committees and the same activation calls when uh, an, a, a regional event is uh, activated. Um, and we coordinate through New York City Emergency Management and Greater New York. So again, just how is through, you said calls? Yes, so uh, New York City Emergency Management will, depending on, you know, will activate a weather steering call or, um, you know, any other emergency call with key agencies. Uh, we are part of ESF-8 um, and we have liaisons to New York City Emergency Management. So any requests that we have, any needs that we have, anything that we can offer any other systems or facilities will go through New York City Emergency Management and they coordinate for the region. So who are the key people? Who are some of the liaisons? Just try to squeeze a few details out of you, if that's okay, Deputy Chief. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yes, and I, you know what, I can actually pass that on to my colleagues at New York City Emergency Management. They probably would be best to speak to that. Sure, thanks very much. Um, so whenever we activate, as, as Laura mentioned, we have, uh, we will convene our uh, weather steering committee calls. And then as part of that also, we're in constant communication with our emergency support function eight or health and medical partners and some of the liaisons and some of the agencies I think that you were asking about. So, so some of those agencies will be New York State Health Department, Greater New York Hospital Association, uh, the uh, City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Health and Hospitals, uh, the Fire Department, um, Veterans Affairs. So we'll have a number of those of those agencies that focus on public health and health and medical issues, um, being able to communicate directly together. So after a storm, there are uh, potential impacts on the facilities themselves, such as pace, patient surges, supply shortages, staffing issues, access to healthcare, and other issues. So how does health and hospitals prepare for such possibilities? We have all hazards emergency operations plans. Um, where we prepare for all hazards on all of our plans. And each of our um, emergency operations plans has specific annexes to address the most likely events given our hazard vulnerab vulnerability analysis for each of our sites and our, <clears throat> our system as well. Um, so we plan according to what our biggest hazards are and we also plan for all hazards. So you have an all hazards emergency preparation plan that helps you prepare for all hazards. I think that's certainly correct. But if you're, so one of the examples I, I gave you, for example, patient surges, how would you deal with that emergency? And does the city provide support with such preparations if you're seeing something like that or even a supply shortage? Yeah, that's a, a great question because we dealt with this. We've been dealing with this for, you know, at least a year and a half now with COVID. So we have multiple ways to um, mitigate issues with staffing, supply, space as well. Um, and again, we start by using internally our system, leveraging each of our facilities. Um, if we're talking about patients, we would move patients, we call it level loading between of our, our facilities where there is uh, opportunity to move them. One overburdened facility uh, would be decanted to a facility that has some room. We also move equipment around between our facilities. Uh, we have coordinated uh, ways of moving equipment as well. And we can uh, you know, open up surge space. We usually leverage our um, trauma centers first for surge space and they will open because they have more um, levels of response than one of our community centers would have. So 
um, they would open up their surge space and we would decant our community centers into our um, trauma centers uh, when need be. So let me ask one, one, one specific thing then before I turn it over to, to my co-chair here. So let's take evacuations, for example. There are many steps involved in the city's process of preparing for the potential need for hospitals to evacuate their patients during a coastal storm. If that happened in a facility like Bellevue, can you please provide an overview of what the process would be? So Bellevue would evacuate first and foremost um, if during a mayor's order. If, if the mayor ordered an evacuation, then Bellevue would evacuate. Um, we have detailed send and receive agreements. Um, we would first evacuate the patients internally. Um, once we leverage all of our internal capabilities, we have send and receive agreements that uh, we have filed with the New York State Department of Health uh, through the health commerce system. And we would leverage those agreements. We would use our own internal um, transportation um, agencies. And when they are exhausted, then we would reach out to New York City Emergency Management who coordinates with um, the HEC, um, which is the Healthcare Evacuation Center. Um, and they would supply us with other transportation needs as well as find us um, open you know, space for our patients if, if we needed extra space. And how are, who's responsible for communicating messages to all hospitals and healthcare facilities? Within our, our own system, you're, you're asking? Yeah, within your own facility and, and how you communicate with the agencies. Who's responsible for communicating those messages to all hospitals and healthcare facilities? So I, I I, as the incident, that is a very good question. I, as the incident commander, uh, would be coordinating communication messages um, to all of our facilities. We, we communicate through um, our mass notification system, Everbridge, through another type of mass notification system that I mentioned, mentioned Alertus. We put up notifications on our emergency alerts blog. We convene um, briefings uh, amongst central office uh, leaders, uh, central office and site leadership, um, and uh, central office emergency operations uh, center and the incident management teams at the site. So these are all separate um, briefings that are held so that we can have a, an open line of communication um, between basically the entire system. And then we also convene system-wide briefings so that leadership throughout the system um, knows what's going on. And then we have all staff briefings as well so that we can get um, information out to uh, every staff member that needs to know what's going on and how to respond. Can you name some of the people that are in the system-wide briefing, like just some titles, like do you, director, sure. deputies? Yes, yes. So um, the system-wide briefing is central office incident management team. So that's the central office leadership. Um, site, um, what we call the C-suites. So the, the uh, CEOs, the COOs, the CMOs, um, the CFOs, uh, site uh, chiefs of medicine, um, public information officers at the sites, um, as well as, you know, key in, if, particularly if we're talking about COVID key infectious disease and, and, infect, and infection prevention needs as well. I appreciate that. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chair for questions and um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Um, I, I wanna go back to the evacuations, but, but first, just from uh, New York City Emergency Management, Health and Hospitals and Greater New York Hospital Association are involved with the uh, operations during a storm situation. Are there other healthcare related organizations that are involved and, and what are they and what is their level of involvement? Um, great question and, and thank you. And it, it really encapsulates the, the collaboration that we have across the healthcare sector when you think about the membership of uh, the health and medical ESF. Uh, not only is it citywide, but it's also state and uh, regional wide as well. Um, so more locally uh, and across the healthcare sector, in addition to health and hospitals and, and Greater New York Hospital Association, as you mentioned, we also have representation from the long-term care sector, 
um, with Greater New York Hospital Association's Continuing Care Arm, uh, the Greater New York Healthcare Facility Association, uh, the Southern New York Association. Um, we also have representatives from the dialysis community with the End Stage Renal Disease Network. Uh, from primary care, we have Chicanies, which is the Community Healthcare Association of New York State, um, Home Health with the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. We also have representations from our blood center partners, the New York Blood Center uh, and Metro Blood Center. Then um, back to evacuations. Um, H and H said that you would supply transportation needs uh, for hospitals if theirs run out. Is that coordinated with FDNY ambulances, voluntary ambulances? And if so, I'm sure the answer is yes. But what other vehicles um, are employed that, that are sort of in your arsenal that are stored or are they under contract or uh, explain how they're provided? Sure. So we have um, a wide range of, of vehicles and partners that we can reach reach out to for assistance during a healthcare facility evacuation, uh, both in a, a coastal storm scenario, uh, as well as in a no notice scenario. Um, some of those that you mentioned, um, we do leverage the fire department um, for command and control uh, and coordination, as well as some of their specialty units like their medical evacuation transport units or their me -tos. Um, There are other additional medical ambulance buses or me -tos in the region. Um, so we work with a New York, New Jersey and Connecticut interstate EMS task force um, there's approximately 20 of those vehicles in the region that we can call upon um, if required. Um, we also work with uh, MTA Paratransit, um, DOE uh, for school buses, um, and we can also contract uh, with our regional EMS council to obtain additional uh, advanced life support and basic life support ambulance resources if needed. Who makes the determination um whether there's an evacuation order or a shelter in place, is it uh, NYCEM or is it the hospital and what factors would go into that? So in a coastal storm scenario, um, that is a recommendation from uh, a joint recommendation from New York State Department of Health uh, and New York City Emergency Management to the mayor. Uh, and the mayor has the ultimate authority uh, to make that decision. Um, when it is a local event, um, the healthcare facility uh, is the one that makes that determination um, about their own capabilities um, or the New York State Commissioner of Health um, could make an order uh, for an individual facility. To can, can you explain how the dispatch for EMS might change under a severe coastal storm? Would we still be sending uh, BLS ambulances when a uh, engine company is responding? Would the protocols change? Um, so I can't speak directly to fire department operations, um, but we would work closely with them to make sure that we uh, can continue to support them in providing uh, 911 services, however we may, at emergency management. How often does New York City Emergency Management review uh, the plans of hospital evacuations uh, for storms, and um, how often do you actually make changes to the plan? So emergency management doesn't review uh, individual hospital plans. Um, we work on our, our citywide planning effort uh, and we routinely um, look at our citywide plans. Um, and then after every response, we hold hot washes and conduct after action reports to see how we can uh, improve those plans uh, based on lessons learned. What was learned by uh, Superstorm Ida? I think with every emergency, uh, one of the things that we learned that we could always do better is just improve communication. Um, we have uh, been working to leverage technology um, to get closer to real-time communication and two-way communication in an emergency with our partners. One of the ways that we've leveraged that, um, especially out of COVID, was the use of Microsoft Teams. Uh, the Health and Medical Emergency Support Function manages an interagency Microsoft Teams channel with close to 300 members from uh, across the city healthcare sector, as well as our regional partners to force the real-time communication. What uh, incident or issue occurred during Ida that caused you to uh, re-examine that? So I, I can. So I think with with as Robert said, with every and it's a great question. With every activation, we we always learn something, small or large. With every exercise, we're always examining ways to to do better. Um, and so with Ida, the, seeing as the impacts across the across the region were so significant, um, we have been working really hard, and we also appreciate the support from the council to really amplify messaging, both to the public as well as to our agency partners. So really making sure that we're educating the public, getting information out about the hazards associated with flash flooding um, and, and really doing everything that we can to amplify that, get, 
get more people. And again, appreciate the support from the council to get people signed up for Notify NYC. Um, those are the types of things that we're really trying to, to do more aggressive messaging around. So I know most of your funding comes from federal grant programs uh, and to a lesser extent, the city. Um, going into a new budget year and, and acknowledging the fact that one of New York City Emergency Management's primary fun focus is to keep things in a warehouse when we need them. Um, what are the things we need in the warehouse that we don't have right now that it's incumbent upon the city council to go out and either lobby the federal government for or figure out a way to fund ourselves? We really appreciate that question. I am gonna, we will take that back. We're still ass assessing and we, I'll take that back and we will, I'm sure we'll be able to come back to you with some, with some uh, details on that, but appreciate the question. Thank you. And I have no further questions. Great, thanks. Thank you, Chair. I'm gonna turn it back to Chair Rivera for any questions. Um, in the meantime, I just wanna remind council members that if you have any questions, you can use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, and I will call on you in the order in which you raised your hands. Um, and I'll turn it back to Chair Rivera. Thank you so much for being here. We just want to, um, in terms of preparedness planned within individual H and H hospitals, I know they differ from one another. And so, I guess, how could the location of a hospital and its corresponding evacuation zone impact their plan? I mean, I thank you for for asking that. One of the um, main differences in the plans, depending on whether or not you are in an evacuation zone or you are not in an evacuation zone, um, is the interim flood mitigation equipment that goes along with um, fortifying the facility. So should uh, an evacuation order be uh, implemented by the mayor or should uh, New York City emergency management indicate it, we those plans would be put in place to uh, set up the interim flood mitigation equipment. Um, additionally, uh, depending on whether or not you're in an evacuation zone or not in an evacuation zone, then you would have plans to, to be able to send or receive during an evacuation order. I see. So, you know, in terms of what I've been able to learn from health and hospitals, which is an incredible amount, you know, over the past four years or so, I realize, I know there are moving targets. It's incredibly hard to coordinate. I mean, we face an unprecedented 18 months of challenges uh, and, and tragedy. Um, so I, I really do appreciate all that you're doing for the city um, and really your, your time here. I don't know if there are any further questions from any of my colleagues, but I wanted to thank you for your testimony. Thank you again so much, uh, Council, for your partnership. And we do look forward to any ideas from the council that you have to improve us and, and would work to implement them. Certainly. I know uh, you have a big advocate in, in council member Borelli here in terms of funding some of your infrastructure projects. You're too kind. Great. <laughs> All right, I just wanna quickly again, ask if any other council members have questions. Again, you can use the Zoom raise hand function. Not seeing any hands, um, just confirming Chair Brelli, do you have any additional questions? I do not, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna thank this panel for their testimony. Uh, we concluded administration testimony at this time and we'll be moving on to uh, members of the public. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify and each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. For panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted um, and we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hands. I'd like to now welcome our first panel to testify. Um, our first panelist will be Jenna Mandel Ritchie. Uh, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, Chair Rivera, Chair Borelli, and members of the Committee on Hospitals, Committee on Fire and Emergency Management, 
My name is Jenna Mandel Ricci. I serve as Senior Vice President for Healthcare System Resilience at the Greater New York Hospital Association. GNYHA proudly represents all voluntary and public hospitals in New York City. And today I will discuss how hospitals across the city plan and prepare for weather emergencies, how we support these efforts and how hospitals respond to emergencies. And I think many of the things that I highlight you've already heard from, from other colleagues that already presented. So a hospital's first priority is serving its community, including preparing for all manner of emergencies so that they can continue to provide care no matter the situation. Hospitals plan for emergencies well in advance. As you heard Dr. Iva Coley state, it starts with an emergency operations plan with indices or chapters that deal with specific hazards that the hospital is likely to encounter based on its geography or emerging threats. For example, New York City hospitals have comprehensive plans for hurricanes, but not wildfires. The emergency operations plan and related indices are the blueprint for all aspects of emergency response, including the hospital's physical infrastructure, supplies, staffing, communication, and continuity of patient care. The weather-related hazards for which New York City hospitals prepare include prolonged heat, winter storms, and coastal storms. And these plans are required by regulatory and accreditation standards that are set by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Joint Commission respectfully, respectively. Given the impacts of previous events, hospitals have worked hard to harden their infrastructure, prepare and train staff, and further develop policy, processes and protocols to support patient movement. Hospitals in flood prone areas, as you've heard, have moved critical equipment to higher floors to ensure continuity of operations. All hospitals are required to have backup power systems and some have even invested in distributed energy resources, usually a type of cogeneration system that allows them to generate their own power independent of the electrical grid. All hospitals are also required to have evacuation plans. These plans detail pre-arrangements with other hospitals that provide similar services, processes to match and transport patients in real time, and considerations related to medical records, medication, and communication with families. Hospitals work in coordination with Greater New York Hospital Association and city agencies such as FIDNI, New York City Emergency Management, and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on evacuation planning and broader emergency planning. GNYHA works closely with all New York City hospitals and multiple response agencies. We have a permanent seat in New York City's Emergency Operations Center. We participate in healthcare coordination bodies, including Emergency Support Function 8 and the New York City Healthcare Coalition. We continuously oh, update all of our members on changes to agency plans, provide opportunities for sharing of best practices, and lead efforts to improve regional processes. We also host a regional information sharing and situational awareness system called SITSTAT, and we closely coordinate with health and hospitals on this. During extreme weather events, we survey New York City hospitals about impacts using pre-developed sets of questions. This system provides all stakeholders with visibility on how hospitals are doing. The morning after the remnants of Hurricane Ida impacted New York City, we quickly deployed a post-landfall coastal storm survey to all of our New York City members in coordination with health and hospitals and determined that very few hospitals were significantly impacted. For those that were, we discerned the nature of the impact, such as IT outages or flooding of operating rooms, and then contacted hospital leadership to gather more details, provide assistance, and connect them to key response partners as necessary. If a weather event is forecast to impact New York City, New York City Emergency Management, as you heard, will host a series of citywide coordination calls that include the National Weather Service. Based on the forecast, NISIM may activate a citywide plan and related resources. NISIM will then make decisions about activation of the Emergency Operations Center, the schedule, and the agencies that must be present. And we, in turn, communicate all information about the forecast and citywide actions to our member hospitals via a special weather bulletin. Hospitals then, based on their own monitoring processes and information provided by us and NISM, may decide to activate an incident management team or hospital command center. The hospital will then follow internal plans and protocols and will likely take precautionary actions, such as checking generators, having extra supplies delivered, and calling in additional staff. The hospital will also complete surveys requested by GNYHA and the New York State Department of Health. Based on the emergency plan that is activated, hospitals will be instructed on which agencies to call for assistance. 
Continuous improvement is a key tenant of emergency preparedness and response. After every real event and training exercise, there is a process to determine what worked and what did not, with the goal of updating plans to address shortcomings. This process helps New York City hospitals ensure that they can fulfill their critical function no matter the weather. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important issue, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'm now going to turn it over to questions from Chair Rivera. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. I, I really appreciate uh, some of the, the details in, in your testimony. I know that you know Greater New York and, and Health and Hospitals are a part of uh, the organizations responsible for supporting health and medical services during a weather emergency including, as you mentioned, facilitating calls and coordinating resource requests. So what does this coordination look like on the ground, for example? And you gave us a little kind of insight, a preview of what that would be. But how was the coordination with organizations during our recent hurricane, Hurricane Ida? So thank you for that question and thanks for this opportunity. So I mentioned that the morning after Ida, we fielded a survey that, which is our, our normal procedure. And we quickly received back information from our members. And then we were able to discern that we had a couple of members, you, for example, mentioned earlier, Richmond University Medical Center. Even before we did the survey, I got a call from their emergency manager who let me know what was going on at that facility in Chair Borelli. I know you're, that's your, your borough. Um, and so we were able to discern what was going on with them. I was able to make contact with folks at the fire department because for a brief time, they were on diversion because their emergency department had, uh, had some flooding. Um, was also able to contact New York City Emergency Management, talk with Rob. We were able to kind of figure out what was going on and that they had a vendor coming over to Richmond University Medical Center to help with some of the dewatering that needed to happen. So what was great about it was we were able to very quickly figure out everyone who was fine, all the hospitals that were fine and weren't having impacts and those that were. And we were really able to focus our efforts on making sure that those hospitals that were having impacts got the support they needed to be back up and running as soon as possible. So that's sort of the, a lot of it is, is phone calls and relationships and making sure folks need to have what they need to, to, to get back to, back to business. So in terms of weather related like emergency functions, you'll say that probably a lot of your communication is just direct, right? You said phone calls. I'm sure there's like a text message system, emails. Yes, and, and another good example um, is all of us have spoken about the Emergency Operations Center. Um, and that used to always be a physical place. Now we do a lot of it virtually, of course. So a very common thing during winter weather emergencies is there's a bunch of snow in the ambulance bay and ambulances can't get to where they need to get to. So a hospital will call us, give us the coordinates, and then we can walk over or call uh, sanitation and make sure that that particular place is prioritized to have snow removal. Because obviously these are critical, this is critical infrastructure. So it always goes to the top of the list. So it's working through very real issues. Another very common one is um, staff having trouble getting to work. So we work very closely with NYPD and all of our other partners to ensure that if there's travel bans, for example, that there's an exemption for healthcare workers, things like that. Thanks. And my last question is, I know every hospital in New York City has to submit an evacuation plan to the New York State Department of Health. So what must be included in these plans? And I guess what I really want to know is how involved is the process of developing them? So um, that is true that they have to submit the plan to the New York State Department of Health in addition and kind of the bigger master that they answer to even above that is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and Joint Commission. And there are very detailed um, standards and regulations around emergency planning. And obviously evacuation planning is, is a big piece of that. And Dr. Ibacoli touched on this earlier. You have to have a plan, not only if you have like a small, let's say there's something called um, 
there's there's full evacuations and then there's partial evacuations. For example, a couple of, of weeks ago, you may recall there was a, a fire at St. John's Episcopal in Queens, and that just required an evacuation of a couple of floors of the hospital to other floors. So hospitals have very good plans in place because obviously moving patients is a really big deal. These are very sick people. So moving patients from one floor to another, and then you also have to have plans in place for a full evacuation. And that includes all kinds of details around how you prepare your patients for evacuation, medical documentation, how you're going to manage communication with the families, how you're going to match that patient with a bed at another appropriate facility, how that communication will work. So all of those pieces, um, are worked out ahead of time and regularly tested and trained on as well. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I think I'm all set with questions. I'll turn it over to my co-chair if you have anything. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for testifying. Um, it's nice to uh, hear the Greater New York Hospital Association. Uh, I was a former member of the state legislature's health committee and you, you guys were so omnipresent in my life for three years. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I haven't had that much exposure to you since the council, but thank you. Um, I, I sort of want to, you know, pretend like we're in the trust tree and talk about um, the cost of healthcare and obviously the cost of preparing for storms and other emergency uh, uh, procedures. There's a cost on your members on that. Do you think there's a way for the city to take over some responsibilities from the private hospital system in terms of equipment and resources uh, and protocols that could that could shift some of the burden to the public sector from your members and thus save them money? In other words, what could we be doing better for you guys? Um, thank you so much for that question. I like the wheel. <laughs> the wheels are turning, and I feel like I need a little a little bit of time to. Um, to respond to that. Um, and I, I might wanna take that back and, and get back to you. I think what works really well is when the, there's, a, in, in general with emergency preparedness and response and, and COVID is obviously a, a ph phenomenal example of this is hospitals and health systems um, have a lot of assets within them and their ability to be able to depend upon those assets and plan around that is incredibly helpful. And it's really the coordination pieces that are the most complex. Um, and I, I think, yeah, let me, I, I mean, I think it's an excellent question and I'd love to take that back to our team here. Yeah, for uh, Richmond University Medical Center had a vendor uh, on contract to uh, alleviate flooding. You know, is, is there a need for uh, Rumsey as a hospital to have a contract like that when New York City Emergency Management could be the contract provider for a number of hospitals, perhaps borough based? And then just, again, maybe that's a small amount of money per year, um, but just cutting back on the costs for emergency preparation. So if you don't mind, I, I think Rob and Megan are still on and they may be in a better position to answer that question. I don't, I, I can't speak to how the city does contracts, you know, specialty contracting. I, I do know they have, they have thought about um, the kinds of services that we need and often do have city contracts available. I, I, can't, I can't actually speak to how that, for, for example, that dewatering vendor, um, who they were on contract with and, and how that went, but perhaps Rob or Megan could. Are you all there? They must have signed off, but either way, thank you very much. And okay. Nice hearing uh, your testimony and look forward to always working with you guys. Um, Chair Borelli, I, I would say, you know, one thing, and this is more of a, of a federal issue is, and again, just, just to make the council aware, there's this, conundrum and emergency management where a lot of the systems are set up so that you get paid back after the event happens, right? The entire FEMA system is based on there's an event and you have to put out money and then you get paid back. There's not, and for a long time at the federal level, there's been a push to have a public health emergency fund that is more, um, that, 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 that can be spent easier and can be can be spent towards response in a, in a faster way. So I think that may be a, a, an aspect of the question that you're asking. Um, it's really that we've had this system for a long time 
where you get paid back after the fact, um, as it, or maybe you get dollars to increase your capabilities for the next event, but it doesn't all kind of work together. We've, we've done some write-ups around things like this, and I'd be happy to share them with you. I, yeah, I'd definitely be interested to, to hear. I mean, so it sounds like, first of all, sorry about my, my I guess my car warranties up or something. Uh, <laughs> it would be helpful for us then to be in a position to front load money and then take the balance of whatever outstanding cash needs are there rather than the hospitals themselves um, spending a lot of their liquid cash in an emergency. Is that essentially? Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's probably more complicated than that. And I'm not the, the best person to talk about this from our team, but we have some very smart finance folks. It's really that the way that we reimburse, it's a reimbursement based process in this country in general um, for emergencies. And for example, during Ebola, if you recall, a number of our hospitals built these very sophisticated, complicated biocontainment units. And then we really had to advocate and fight like hell to get them paid back for doing that because the levers that are available are not very flexible. Um, and they're really based on capital costs and other things. and. It's, it, we need a more nimble system given climate change, given infectious disease outbreaks that allows the healthcare system to be more nimble. The system itself is nimble, the payment structures are not nimble. I think that, that's, a, that's a fair assessment. I, I agree, I mean, we, we have no public hospital in Staten Island, so we have used uh, our council and our city budgets uh, to try to outfit our private hospital systems with equipment. And I mean, just the capital process for that is extremely burdensome to give Staten Islanders some public resources. So I, I definitely thank you and appreciate your comments and I have no further ones. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Borelli. Um, quickly, just reminding council members if they have questions, they can use the Zoom raise hand function. I'm gonna turn it back to Chair Rivera. Thanks again. I just one last question. How do hospitals communicate with patients and communities during emergencies? I think she has to be unmuted. Yeah. I'm sorry, Chair Rivera, I was trying to unmute myself. Can you repeat the question? Of course, I just said, how do hospitals communicate with patients and communities during emergencies? Um, I, I, I cannot speak to, directly to this because we're a little bit far removed, but I can tell you that as part of the Joint Commission standards and the CMS regulations that communication with families is a, is a key um, expectation. And that can be everything from making information available on the website to having a process in place for like a phone bank, and then obviously doing outward communication. And that's really critically important if you're starting to move patients. Obviously, the, those family members need to know where their family, where their loved one has been moved and how to be in contact with the new care team. So a lot of effort has been put into those communication plans. I appreciate that very much. And, and I know the, the one thing is that we definitely want to see uh, the materials about a public fund instead of relying on, on reimbursement. So thank you for sure. everything. Thank you for being here uh, and for your testimony. And with that, I'll turn it back over uh, to committee council. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm just confirming there are no further questions. I see no hands. So um, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony. Um, at this time, we um, have concluded public testimony. Um, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and is yet to be called, please use a Zoom raise hand function now and you'll be called on in the order in which you've raised your hand. Okay, seeing no hands, I'm going to turn it back to Chair Rivera and Chair Borelli for closing remarks. Chair Rivera? I just want to thank everyone uh, for being here for their testimony for making this hearing possible. You know, as, as I mentioned, 20% of the city's hospital beds are in or near flood zones. 
And with climate change accelerating uh, these types of uh, dramatic events and disasters, uh, we certainly want to be helpful and supportive to our hospital systems, as well as every agency involved with fire and emergency medical services. So, so thanks to everyone, of course, and, and a special thank you to uh, my co-chair Borelli. I don't know, uh, Chair Borelli, if you wanna say anything in closing before we adjourn? I'll just associate with myself with the comments that you had made because they were so eloquently done. Thank you. Go Red Foxes. All right, well, thanks everyone, uh, I guess. And with that, I will uh, adjourn the hearing. Have a great day.